you all know that. So, all right. Praise the Lord. If you would, go ahead, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And um, normally, so normally we're going through 1 Timothy um, verse by verse, and we're over in chapter 1. Um, and I don't normally do like a special message or anything, but I figured today would be a good day to do that. And so then that's one of the things that we're going to be able to talk about this morning. And um, so it kind of goes along with what we're dealing with in First Timothy, but we're a little bit farther away than, than where we have been. Um, but notice here in First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground, of the truth. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. It has been preserved throughout the years and ages that we can have it, we can handle it, we can study it, and we can take that information and apply it to our lives that we can be to the praise and honor and glory of your grace. We're thankful for the day that we have. We're thankful for the opportunity to be able to meet together with, with saints of like precious faith. Uh, and our, our goal here is that we, we come together and um, uh, live for one another uh, for, for your glory. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So one of the things that we see here, if you back up to chapter 3, verse 1, Paul starts laying out, here's, here's how things should be done in the local assembly. Verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. You go down a little bit farther on in verse 12, he says, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. So he's starting to lay out, here's how things are supposed to work in the local assembly. Well, he gets to verse 15, and he says, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know... How thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground, pillar and ground of the truth. One of the things that we've always talked about, you know, no matter where we've been, the whole issue with what we're here for is to do what? To be a pillar and ground of the truth. That's the purpose of the local assembly. So when we start talking about this local assembly, one of the first things that I notice here, um, when, when you look at this, he says, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave, behave thyself in the house of God. Now, pause there for real quick. <clears throat> most places, most places, uh, well, most people, if you're not in a church-looking building, they're not going to go. And that's one of those things that we've known for years. I mean, when we met at um, Serve Pro. People are not going to want to come to a business. When we go over here at the hotel, not a lot of people want to come. Um, obviously, what we've done at the hotel has been fabulous. I mean, the fact that we had a space and we knew that almost every Sunday we had that space, um, that was an interesting thing. And we, we were able to advertise and say, this is where we are. The fact that we're here now, it's not the building's not the issue. It's the people in the building, Right. Who is the body of Christ? Who is the church, the body of Christ? The church, which is his body, is according to Ephesians. It's the people, those who are in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're, you're a member of the church, the body of Christ. That's the big issue. And when we start taking a look at, okay, what Paul's laying out here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is there's some, some issues with the local assembly. Here's how things are supposed to work. And he says, that thou, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, one of the first things that just jumps out at me is the church of the who? The living God. Now, you take that, and that's in stark contrast over in Acts chapter 17, right? You know, you, we also see this with bell worship. When, when, when you've got... Go over real quick to Acts chapter 17. Hold your place there. Go to Acts chapter 17 and just kind of remind ourselves of some of these things. We've been through a lot of this stuff before, but um, I, want us, I want us to be able to, to put these things together. Notice here in Acts chapter 17, <clears throat> um, Paul's at Athens. And notice in verse, verse 16. Well, actually, let's start with verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus. So Timothy, who he's talking to in 1 Timothy 3, he's there with him at this point. 
and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So he's saying, Silas, Timotheus, I want you to come here, and they do. Notice here in verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was, was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So when you stop and you think about that, and of course you, you, you attach that to the stuff that we talked about in the first session about this, this corrupted wisdom that is all over the world, that's what, that's what Paul saw these in. They were, they were wholly given, the city was wholly given, completely and totally given to idolatry. Notice, therefore he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and said, What will this babbler say? <laughs> Have you ever had that feeling? You start talking to somebody about right division, they're like, oh, What's this babbler got to say? That's usually the way it's thought of, right? <clears throat> Notice, Oh, there's some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him into Areopagus, saying, May we know what this, underline that next word, new doctrine. Now, what we know about these folks, because we're going to get told this, is what do they do? They don't do anything except spend their entire time trying to find out new things. So when they come up and say, what's this new doctrine whereof thou speakest? That's one of the greatest points in scripture that you can say what Paul was teaching was different than what came before him. And the Epicureans and the, and the folks here, Arapagus and all these folks, they would say what? This is new. This is different than anything we've ever heard before. Notice, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in, notice this, Nothing else <laughs> but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's all they cared about. Now, you take that and you, you write that in modern vernacular. What's most people all about today is kind of the same thing. They're still looking for some new thing. And that, that's one of those things that we see here. But notice, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I pass by and behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. These people are worshiping, and they don't even know who they're worshiping. They've got an altar set up to an unknown God, and they're saying, we're going to go and worship this guy, and we don't even know who it is. <laughs> That's how bad that they are with this. Notice, Paul says, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. If you want to know who this guy is, who this God is, I'm going to tell you who he is. Notice, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeth, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, notice, dwelleth not in the temples made with hands. Now there's a couple things I want you to think about that real quick. If he doesn't dwell in the temples made with hands, does that mean he dwells somewhere? By the way, if you dwell somewhere, that means you're what? You're alive. You're living. There's, there's something that's, that you're a part of, that there's something. And, that, and when Paul talks about the church of the living God, there is a particular stamp that he's saying, here's where it is. Now, that's that issue as we go down through, and he, he brings us up again. Uh, dealing with that, but go back to First Timothy chapter three, and I want us to be able to think about these things. The issue, first of all, is <clears throat> the purpose of us meeting here is because we're serving a living God, and that's that's the first thing that, that kind of jumps out at me. There's a whole bunch of stuff here, but notice. <clears throat> but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Again, not so much the building itself, but how is it that you're you're living, and how is it that you behave with, with everybody that's around you that's part of that church of the living God? Notice, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, think about this. He's writing to Timothy, correct? Where's Timothy the pastor of? He's the pastor of the church in Ephesus, which is dealing with a lot of that stuff with Diana and all those things. 
So he's talking to Timothy, who is the pastor of a particular church, and he's saying, here's how things are supposed to be done in the church. And I want you to notice some things. First thing is I want us to look at this issue of the pillar. Now, real quick, we're going to do a bunch of jumping, but I want us to be able to see this stuff. Go back to Judges 16. Judges chapter 16, and I want, us, I want us to see something real quick. Um, and if, if, if you don't know um, where we are, Judges 16 is Samson and Delilah, right? But I want us to notice something here real quick. Judges chapter 16, um, let's take a look at this real quick. Verse Verse 23. <clears throat> Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their god. Notice that little lowercase g there. And to rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson our enemy into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Now you can pause there real quick. How often do people say that our 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 enemies have been delivered to us by God. A lot of times people will do that. The, you know, you go through, through, throughout history and you've got where a country will defeat another country and they say, God gave us this country. God, God, we were able to destroy them and destroy our enemy because of God. They're thinking the capital G God, but this is really who they're dealing with. Notice, drop down to verse 26. And I want us to be able to see this. Notice, <clears throat> verse 25. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may make us sport. And they called, Sam, called for Samson out of the prison house and made a sport. And they set him between the pillars. Now, what we're going to notice here is what's the purpose of the pillars here? Verse 26, And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now, what do you notice there? What's he using the pillar of this house for to begin with? He's wanting to lean on it, right? I want some sort of support is really what he's looking for, right? Verse 27. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 300 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me. I pray thee and strengthen me. I may pray thee. Only this once, O God, oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and on the other his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords, upon all the people that were there. And he goes on down through there. What were those pillars there for? They were supporting that building, and what's, what happens is he pushes them out, and what happens? It crumbles. He uses it, he uses it as a place where he can lean upon to kind of get some support, and then what he do is he takes away the support of their particular temple of what they've got going on there in Philistine, or yeah, in, in, in the, for the Philistines there. So that's one way that you can look at this issue. Notice what he says there in verse 29. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the what? The house stood. Now, if you think back to 1 Timothy, what's he say? That this is how you should behave thyself in the what? Really, the house of God is what he's dealing with there. So there's this issue of support. There's something else that I want us to think of, too. When it comes to the local assembly, go back to Exodus chapter 13 real quick. Or Chapter 13. <clears throat> and I want us to see, I want us to see some things. So the first thing I want us to be able to see is what? Here we've got this pillar in Judges 16 is used to lean on for a support, and it's also supporting the house, and when he pushes them, the house falls, right? So you've got support with the pillar. 
Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a what? Pillar of a cloud. To what? To lead them the way. This particular pillar here is to do what? Is that to support or to lean on? It's to lead, right? So this particular pillar is to do what? It's to lead. Notice, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of the fire by night from before the people. So what do we see here is you've got this pillar of the cloud is to do what? It's to lead them the way and then the pillar of light is to what? So that they can see. Well, what do we know about Scripture? It is a light into my path and a lamp into my feet. So what's that do? It's a light unto my path. What are you going to do in a path? That's the way to go. And how are you going to do that? You need to be able to see where you're going. So this, these two particular pillars that we see here, what are they for? Well, it's to lead and to give light. Chapter 14. Here's what's also interesting. Um, chapter 14, verse 24. Notice this. This one's kind of interesting to me. Um, you stop and think about this. The Egyptians at this particular time, they are a picture of the world, right? Their wisdom is the corrupted wisdom and all that stuff. But I want you to notice this real quick, verse 24. What else is this, what else is this pillar that we see here that God set up for the nation of Israel? And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, notice, and troubled the hosts of the Egyptians. <laughs> now, the pillar there was designed to be what for the nation of Israel? Is a, it's to lead them and to give light. Well, what's it end up being for their enemies? It troubled them. Do you know why people don't like this book? It's because it troubles them. It tells, the it tells the truth. And it says, here's where you are. Here's where God is. You're not the same. You've missed the mark. If you want to be where God is, what do you have to do? You have to have His righteousness. And if you don't have His righteousness, you're not going to be where God is. And the fortunate thing for us is we live in a day and time where God will give you His righteousness the moment you trust in what His Son's done on the cross. By, tr by simply trusting what the, death, what the death of Jesus Christ has done for us all, by believing in that, you are given God's righteousness. And now you've not missed the mark. You're in Him. You're perfect. And it troubles those and the reason we know it troubles those is because it troubles us it did right sometimes people a lot of times don't even understand <laughs> uh, how bad that might be <clears throat> go over to numbers go over to numbers chapter 14 <clears throat> numbers chapter 14 so what do we have so far we've got the pillar in the old testament scriptures what we see here is what it's a support. It leads the way. It gives light. It troubles the enemies. Uh, notice here in Numbers 14, 14. This one's, this one's another one of those that's just kind of, it's, it's interesting when you look at this. Notice in verse 14. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou art among that the Lord that that thou Lord art among his this people, that thou Lord art seen what face to face. Where are you going to find the Lord? Well, we're going to find out here in just a second. And that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. This pillar here, what does it do for them? That's the place where you can hear the Lord, and that's also where you can see Him face to face. Now, you think about that. <clears throat> Do you know of a verse where Paul talks about something being seen face to face? And he's talking about the Scriptures 
And that's exactly what he's dealing with. So there's some things there that I want us to be able to see. That's the place, this, this particular pillar of the cloud and the pillar of the fire, it's what? That they can hear what the Lord has done and also to be able to see him face to face. So this issue of being able to commune with the God of heaven and earth. Um, go back to Exodus chapter 33. We skipped over this one, but Exodus chapter 33. And uh, also grab Numbers chapter 12 right there. We're going to put these two together. Notice here Exodus 33 and also Numbers chapter 12. Notice <clears throat> Exodus chapter 33. Start off here in verse 9. If you notice, notice in verse 7. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called, the, called it the tabernacle of the congregation. What was the purpose of the tabernacle? There's a few things, right? With the tabernacle, what was it? That was the place you had, you had the inner court, then you had the inner, inner court, right? That's where the priest would go in and be able to offer the, the, the sacrifices and all that stuff. And that was where God was, was the inner, inner, right? So then when you think about this, what they're doing is they're carrying around with them. Could you imagine having to pack this building up <laughs> and go wherever we go, take it back home with us? That's basically what they did. Every time, every time they would pack up and they would carry this, they were, they were taking this. And what we see here, drop down to verse, verse 9, notice. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. So you stop and you think about that real quick. That, that particular cloudy pillar, what was it designed to do? with the nation of Israel. And what happened here is what? Moses spoke with the Lord. Notice in verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses how? Doesn't that remind us of what we had just a minute ago? As a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Notice Numbers chapter 12. We see the same thing here again in verse 5. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. Numbers 12, 5. My bad. Did I say Exodus 12? Okay. I'll blame you then, Bruce, because you weren't paying attention. No. Numbers 12, 5, right? Let's do that again. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. What were they able to do? God comes down in this, in this cloud, this pillar of cloud, at this tabernacle, and what did he do? Called for Aaron and Miriam. Does that kind of remind you of going back to the Garden of Eden when he's walking out and he says, Where art thou, Adam? That we, we see the same, same kind of things here. So what do we see? We've got the, the pillars back in the Old Testament. What were they to do? They were to be a support. They were to lead the way. They were to give light. They troubled the enemies. And then we see that it's face to face. And actually the Lord spoke with Moses in this particular way. Now, real quick, I want you to think about this real quick. Where does God dwell today? Go to 1 Timothy real quick. First Timothy chapter 3, and get Ephesians chapter 3 as well. Um, do we all, we all know Galatians 2.20, right? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live by the faith, I live by, or live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who, who loved me and gave himself for me. The moment that we get 
saved. The moment that we trust in what Christ did, the Trinity takes up residence in us. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the God, the Godhead, dwells in us. When we think about those things, that's where this stuff kind of shows up. Notice here, um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. When God's dealing with, with, with Timothy through Paul here about the local assembly, he's saying, here's all these things that I want you to do, and I want you to think about how you behave yourself. Notice <clears throat> verse 15, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He's dealing with the, the local assembly there. Notice in verse 16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. One, in, one thing that's really interesting about the, the doctrine of godliness is Paul's the one that teaches us a lot about it. And when you think about, when you think about what's going on, um, hold your place there. Get that in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Because I want you to think about this as we, as we take a look at, uh, look at that verse. <clears throat> um, and then we'll talk about 1, Corinth, or 1 Timothy 3 there. Notice in Galatians chapter 20. And I want us to see this. Because Galatians 2.20 is one of those verses that just, it revolutionized my life. You know, a lot of times people say, well, what's a verse that just kind of, did it for you well galatians chapter 2 verse 20 when i actually read through it a few times i was like that can't be what it says but it is and it never changed notice i am crucified with christ that's that's romans chapter 6 nevertheless i live that's also romans chapter 6 yet not i but christ liveth where in me and the life which I, what? Now live. Not way out in the ages to come. He's saying the life I now live, where? In the flesh. Again, we know that there's wonderful things out there in the ages to come that's just, you can't even imagine yet. But I want us to think about this. He's saying that there is a life that Christ lives in us now that, that we don't live by anything. Notice, that I, that which, I, which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is God interested in us now and his life being put on display in our flesh now? The answer is yes, according to Galatians 2.20. Now go back over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. With that thought process in mind, notice this. Verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up unto glory. Is that verse talking about Jesus Christ? Yes. But also, what's it talking about? God putting his life on display in our flesh, Galatians 2.20. There's a reason that Galatians comes before 1 Timothy is because he wants us to know that the life that we live now in this flesh, God is choosing to manifest his, his life in our flesh where? Now, where we live. And so then when we look at this, we see that the church of the living God, the pillar and, the ground, the pillar and ground of the truth, there is a place where God is putting his life on display. It's not in an inner, inner circle of the tabernacle, but it's in the life of each and every one of us. And the purpose that we get to be able to come here and meet is to be able to talk about those things and how those things should apply to every single detail of life so that we can actually stop by, step back and say, it's not I, but Christ living in me. And that's the purpose that, that, that you meet. And that's what he's talking about as he's going down through here. Is we are to be this, this place when we meet together. Our goal is that we would support each other. And we've talked about it over and over again. You go over to Philippians and he talks about um, others over self. We've kind of dubbed that as our, one of our little sayings that we have here is 
others over self. That we would, that my goal is to esteem you all better than myself. And then you all would esteem each other and me better than yourself. And if we have everybody else's concerns in, in mind rather than our own, then we can be that support to one another and we can be that leader of the way and give the light to and we can be the ones that would trouble those that are around us and we'd be able to be able to see each other face to face and be able to deal with and live with and worship God the way that he's designed it to worship. And it's by his life being put on display every single day. That's the purpose of, 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 of this. So when we talk about a pillar, you know, years ago I thought, well, a pillar is just a place that, you know, it holds something up and, and holds it. And I was like, okay, we, we want to be the pillar of God. We're going to hold God's word. What's well, more than that? It's a place where you can come and find support and need and help. And also offer help and support and need for others. And it doesn't just start when you walk into the door and end when you walk out. But what we do is we take the things that we learn here and go live it wherever we are. So that there's little churches <laughs> wherever we go. And we're putting God's life on display no matter where we go. And we can be those things for those people in any situation, no matter what. So then when we think about the pillar, that's one thing that the church, the local assembly is to be. Another thing is the, the ground. Notice in 1 Timothy 3.15, he says, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Well, go real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When you think of ground, what do you think of? There's a couple different things I think of. One is soil, right? You plant seeds, what happens? Stuff grows up. Well, when you, look at, when you look at that word ground, what he's really dealing with is the idea of a foundation of being settled. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. And this, this one's one of those things that's really interesting because it ties into what we just got through talking about. Verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's what? Building. Where's God living today? Where's His building? It's in us. He's living in us. Notice, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, He says, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. When you talk about the, the, the ground, there should be, you know, there's a reason why we've kind of taken stands on things throughout the years. One, we believe that salvation is by trusting in what Christ did on the cross and that alone. You don't have to walk an aisle, say a prayer, do anything. You don't have to give. All you have to do is simply trust in what Christ has done. We've taken a stand on that. We're not going to move away from that. That's part of that, that, that ground, being grounded and settled on stuff and not being moved away because there's a foundation. And as soon as, you know, have you ever laid a foundation for a house? Probably some of, I know some of us have. If you ever lay a foundation of a house... <clears throat> Have you ever tried to move a house off the foundation and move it to another foundation? It's a mess. And if you don't get it right, what can happen is you can destroy the entire church or the house or whatever it is. But Paul's saying, I've laid the foundation, which we find out in verse 11, it's Christ. But he says what? But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. The purpose of us meeting is also that we can make sure that we're all building with the same materials. You know, we've often said this before. You know, I've got, I had three different songs this morning that I had picked out. And if I would have given everybody a different song, and I said, all right, everybody ready to sing, and then we have three songs going on at the same time, it's not going to be good, right? It's chaos, and there's all that. So what do we do? There's one song, we're going to sing this song, and that's what we're all going to sing together. That's that same issue of taking heed how we, how he built it thereupon. Our goal is to be able to help edify one another. Go to Ephesians chapter 3 and we see the same, same sort of issue 
here in Ephesians chapter 3. And of course, who is it that Paul is talking to in Timothy? Is of course Timothy, who is the pastor of this church here in Ephesus. But notice here in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 14, and this is, one of, this is one of Paul's prayers for the folks here at Ephesus. And I would say this would be a good prayer for each of us to have for one another. Verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Why? That. Here's the purpose. He would grant you according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit, where? In the inner man. What do we know? The, old, the, the, the outer man perishes, though the outward man perishes, the inward man is what? Renewed day by day. The inner man is the issue. Why? Why would we need to be strengthened with his might, by his spirit, in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by what? Faith. Faith. Not by emotions, not by, not by having to do things, this thing, this thing, this thing. It's by faith, by taking God's word at what it says. What's the purpose of that? That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, that's where it starts off. You've got, what's, what's interesting there is you've got what? Faith. Love, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And he goes on down through there. So there you have faith, love, knowledge. You have hope that's going on there. Those are all those things that Paul talks about, faith, love, and charity, right? Back over in 1 Corinthians 13. But what, what's it start off at? That he may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's Galatians 2.20. That ye be in what? Rooted and grounded in love. Well, how is that going to happen? Well, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Notice in verse... Verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the, the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. And he goes on down through there. So when you think about this, what? Continue in the faith, how? Grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Well, how does that work? Go back to chapter 2, verse 6. Notice. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Well, question, how did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By faith. In what? In what God said. Verse 7. We see it. Rooted and built up. Where? In him. And established in the faith. As you have been taught. Abounded there in with thanksgiving. So when we talk about the, the pillar. The pillar is to be what? The place where you can go for strength. And you're going to learn some stuff about how to be. Who we are. That God's already made us to be. And where you're going to do that is, what's going to be the, 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 the result of that is, we should be grounded and settled and rooted, as he says there, and built up in him, established in the faith, and not moved away from where we're supposed to be. Well, as he says, it's the pillar and ground of the what? Truth. So the truth is the core issue. It's a pillar of truth it, the truth is what gives strength right and it's not it's not the and that's kind of what what i'm what i'm going at as we're talking about this 
The truth is what gives strength. His, his, his word is his power. We, we've talked about it before. Ecclesiastes says what? Where the word of the Lord is, there is power. Where the word of the king is, there's power. There's power there. There's the, that's, that's, that, that's, that, that's that ability to hold you up is the truth. What do we know about John 14, 6? It says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Exactly. What do we know about John 17, 17? He says what? Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Um, we're over here. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> if, if a church as a group does not settle on the truth it will never be stable and it cannot make its people stable also each other person's free will has to believe by themselves what the verses say or they'll never be stable notice this you know there's a saying that I've, I've kind of taken from John Verstegen all too often we try to do things to make things better and we're never going to one of the things that he said is let the word of god do the work of god simply means what quit trying to do stuff and just believe the verses because when you believe the verses what it's going to do is it's going to work notice here in second corinthians chapter six Notice, notice this. This is, to me, I find this very interesting. Notice, we'll just start off in verse 3. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known. Have you ever stopped and thought about this? You know, oftentimes we, Delilah and I, will talk about, you know, and sometimes it's a good thing. Nobody really knows that we exist as a church. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. But notice, as unknown yet well known. You know, it's interesting to think about how the world measures success. Success is you've got a multi-million dollar establishment. You've got hundreds of thousands of people that show up. You might have two or three services a day. That's that's what a lot of people think. Well, that's success. Well, that would be success according to the world's thinking, which is that corrupt wisdom we talked about earlier. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is success. And I've always, I've always, I've always kind of gone along with that. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same... Don't change stuff. The same, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Me getting in and studying the Bible and knowing some stuff doesn't make me successful. Me standing up here and telling you all stuff that I've learned doesn't make me successful. You all going and living what I've said doesn't make me successful. But what, ha what it is, is if you're able to go and tell the next person the exact same thing and you see it live in their life, then I've been successful. And it's not what a lot of people look at. That's the success. If you can replicate Christ's life in other people, and then they can go and replicate it in other people as well, that's success. That's his life being put on display. That's the purpose of the, of the pillar and the ground of the truth 
as we take a look at those things. And that's what we see here. It's by what? By the word of truth, by the power of God. You look at that stuff. You look at verses 4, 5, and 6 there. Or 4 and 5. We've all dealt with a lot of that stuff, especially over the last few years. I mean, we've always dealt with all kinds of things, but really over the last couple of years, we look at those things like, I'm, I see some of that stuff in my life. What's the answer to it? Well, verse 7, it's the word of truth, the power of God, the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. He gives us the answer. Here's how you deal with this stuff, and here it is. Um, let's, get, let's get two other verses, and we'll finish up. <clears throat> get, uh, get Galatians chapter 3 and Colossians 1. Galatians chapter 3 and Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> you know, as we think about these, as we think about these things, one of the things that I want us to think about is um, no matter if we're at Serve Pro or whether we're at our own house or whether it we're at Holiday Inn Express or whether we're here, the church of God has existed wherever we are. The big difference is what we can now say to the rest of Frankfurt, especially, and anybody else around, is if you want a place that's going to stand on the truth in a time where truth is really hard to find and it's mingled and meshed up and, and all this other stuff with half-truths and half-false, half, half, half but if you want a place you can find... Our goal is to be that place. Our goal is to be that place where you can go and find strength through His Word. That you can find that through His Word. Our goal is to be that place. Notice here in Galatians chapter 3, this is, this is where a lot of folks, saved folks by the way, this is where a lot of saved folks might be, <clears throat> is right here in Galatians 3.1. Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? For who, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, or are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? if it be yet in vain. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And going down through here, notice in verse 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. When you take a look at this, a lot of times what people will do is they'll say what? You're saved by grace, but here's a checklist to stay saved. Here's a checklist to show that you're saved. And here's a checklist so that you can make sure that you've done everything right. There is no checklists. That's what Paul is talking to the folks here in Galatia. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? And I've often done this myself, and I know a lot of us have too. We're like, all right, if I do this, this will be the thing, and I'll just go do it. And that's not going to work. And what's going to happen every single time is we're going to fall flat on our face every single time that we try to do that. It may take a little while, but we'll get there. But that's one of those things that we, that we have. We'll finish off with this. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. <clears throat> verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before, where? In the word of the truth of the gospel. There is, there is a place that, should, that we should be able to find truth. There is a place that people should be able to go to. That would be what Paul says is the pillar and ground of the truth. The place that you can go find the truth, be 
be strengthened by the truth, be supported by the truth, let the truth lead the way, let the truth give the light. It's not anything that we can do, it's all the scriptures. The scriptures are the thing that allows us to see God face to face. The scriptures are the things that allows God to speak to us today. People say, well, I want God to speak to me. Well, read the book. That's it. He's not going to miraculously show up and say, here's what I want you to do. The greatest place that God's ever intervened in our life is at the cross. And we should look to that and that alone for all that. And the way, the place you're going to find that is in the scriptures. Our goal here, now that we have this place, and it's always been the goal, but now we have a place that we can say, Frankfurt, surrounding areas, if you want a church that's going to care, if you want a church that's going to preach the truth, no matter what, this will be the place. We want this to be the pillar and ground of the truth for this area just as the church in Ephesus was at that particular time for those folks in, in Ephesus. So that's one of those things, when we, when, we, when we have stuff, like we've been meeting over there, we were still doing the same thing over there. We're not going to change anything. It's just we can actually do things here that we've not been able to do before. And we want to say, if you want a place to come, we don't have stadium the theater seating, <laughs> but come. This will be the place. If you want to find strength, you want to find help, you want to find support, you want to find this, we want to be the place for you. And if that's what, that, that, and that's what we'll do. We'll always be here until we move to another place maybe. Somebody said, somebody posted on Facebook for us and said, um, now keep doing what you've been doing and outgrow this place so you can go get something else. I'm like, oh. I'd be okay with that. Hopefully after a year, because we got this place at least for a year. So there you go, there you go. We'll see if they can tear down a couple more walls if we need to. Uh, we'll take over this law office next door if we need to. Uh, but this is that. Like I said, we've always been doing this, but now this is a place where this is set aside. This is the only thing that happens in this building. Is what we're doing. We don't have to worry about anything else. I know a lot of people don't like to go to hotels. It is kind of weird. I'm not going to lie. To show up at a hotel and go to church. Because um, you got people walking in and out. This place, the only people who are here are the ones that want to be here for the truth. And we want to make sure that that place stays that way. I do want to thank you all for being here today. Folks online, we greatly appreciate you all as well. Um, Questions, comments, concerns. I'm excited. I hope you all are too. I, I feel like, I've said this before, I think, that, I think that there's some things that we can do now that we've not been able to do in the past. Something's happening. And I was talking to Renee the other day. You know the worst thing to do right now in the economy and everything? Is go start a church. <laughs> Go get a building and start a church and have a church going. And with the way the things are working, you're like, man, this is, this is the worst idea. But you know the best time to do it? Right now. You know, we've talked about, we've talked about, you go back to Genesis and you talk about the winter time, the spring time, and the summer and the fall. We've talked about that cycle. And we've talked about the fact that, you know, we're in this winter cycle where we're getting ready to prepare for what we're going to do in spring. What you do in the winter is, you think, okay, what do, we want to, what do we want to plant when spring comes? Well, what we're wanting to plant is what we're doing right now, what we're doing here. And what we're going to do is we're going to prepare for things. What do you do in the summertime is you cultivate it and take care of it. And what you do in the fall time is you reap what you've sown during the spring. What we're doing now, we have a tremendous opportunity to do something. Not for name or anything like that, yet not I but Christ. And I'm looking forward to it. And I hope you all do too. And it's good stuff. Good stuff. All right.